since we started in 2007. So please support it. It's ten dollars, and it's a very worthy cause. I can think of fewer things in the world that we need more than Muslim education. As a matter of fact, I've always said that if we would follow suit of the Catholics and give education away, we would be a Muslim nation within five years. Okay. Um, this is also another great thing that's going on. It's a um, Chamber of Commerce, a Muslim Chamber of Commerce, and their 2015 business kickoff network event, the 29th of January. Um, I will leave this up here. It's uh, 5.30 to 8 on 2250 North OBT. That's easier to remember than Orange Blossom Trail. It's or, in Harris Bay. It's which it's Harris, Harris Bank. Bay, the Princeton branches. Harris Bay. That's a very good. So I'll leave this up here for anybody. This is a great thing to build business. Um, Pampered Chef, I'll maybe get involved with this. Um, if anybody wants Pampered Chef items, May soon is a Pampered Chef uh, queen. So. Um, In May, say it's free events. Free with the financial pay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Well, let me just put it here. Anybody wants to see it that way? It's not going to be there. The other thing is that we do still collect non-perishable items. If everybody would just bring one can or a bag of beans or something, it's part of Dahl. We donate this to local food pantries, and they get to see that Muslims also care about other people besides just ourselves. And it's really important for us to participate in that. If you have ink, empty ink or toner cartridges, we turn those in to make money so that we can do Dawa. So we will take them off your hands. Unbroken cell phones, we sort of snacked up. I guess I've gotten every one that I can get from you. We have um, one today. But we got one today, yes. Because we've donated about 700, and those phones are actually um, converted into phones to help victims of domestic violence. So we really like to do that. As many of you know, this year I was nominated to be the vice chair of the Orange County Domestic Violence Task Force. And we hope to see a lot more things happening this year. In fact, hopefully to get more community people involved so that people can see that Muslims stand out against injustice, just as the Quran says. Group information, if you'd like to know what's going on with ISLM, call this number. Mason is standing up over there. She will get you hooked up. All of these classes are uploaded to YouTube. And you can review the class, or if you miss the class, you can watch the class. And you can also have other people that are interested in a way of learning. They can hook up with our group and watch these classes. So this is the way to do that. And also to get all of the notifications. We usually do a potluck every month. We won't be having one this month because we can have a place. Um, the church that we usually use is unavailable. And um, we didn't have a place to have it. So sorry about that, but that's... Hopefully next month we'll be able to help. Anyway, so would anybody like to share where we have been or what we've been talking about? Anybody? Don't everybody jump at the same time. Okay? George on for the history of the Kaaba. The history of the Kaaba, yes. We're covering that. Very good. What else? We talked about wisdom. We talked about wisdom, yes. I'll have to... Um, Got a lot of positive feedback about last week's le lecture uh, on wisdom, sanctification, and the book, Hikmah. Yeah. Anybody else want to share anything you've learned recently? Knowledge applied in practice. Very good, very good. Good. So today we're actually going to move in because a large portion of Surah al-Bakra addresses Tawheed, monotheism. As a matter of fact, it is one of the third highest values in the Holy Quran. You can hardly read seven or eight verses of the Quran that you don't find something that addresses the issue of monotheism, Tawheed, that there is only one God. In verse 30, 130, which we are at today, we still have not gotten to the halfway mark of Surah al-Baqarah. And who turns away from the religion of Ibrahim 
of Islam, that is Islamic monotheism, except him who fools himself. Truly we choose him in this world, and verily in the hereafter he will be among the righteous. What's the problem? We got the wrong slide up there? Okay. Do I? Here. Uh-oh. Let me see. It was 1173, right? No, it was 11. There it is right there, 1182, I believe. I'm sorry. Yeah, that means that in this, just in Sorol Bakra, we've had 1100, we actually got over 1200 slides, uh, just covering 130 verses. Quite a, quite a lot of material. So verse 131, when his when his Lord said to him, Submit, that is, be a Muslim, he said, I have submitted myself as a Muslim to the Lord of the Alameen, the mankind jinn and all that exists. And this submission to Allah, Islam was enjoined by Ibrahim, Abraham, salam, upon his sons and by Yaqub, Jacob, saying, O oh my sons, Allah has chosen for you the true religion, then die not except as Muslims. And this is really amazing because if we go back and you remember when we talked about the Qibla, the Qibla was first here by whom? Adam. Adam a. And when it was being rebuilt, the walls were raised from that Qibla that was built by the Prophet of Islam, Adam a. And then various prophets, over 125,000 came to bring people back to monotheism, to Tawheed, to bring people back to the worship of one God. And of course, Ibrahim is the father of monotheism, or is known as the father of the monotheistic faith. So Christians claim Ibrahim as the father of their religion. Jews claim Ibrahim as the father of their religion. We claim Ibrahim as the father of our religion. So we see here in the Quran that this is being reinforced. And we see here that Ibrahim was a Muslim, calling people to one God, just as all of the other prophets. Did you have a question, brother? Yes, I was just trying to understand. Except him who fools himself truly. It's just people who are blind or just try to fool themselves into not believing monotheism? Or? Well, just. What I will say here is I don't believe there's an excuse for being um, ignorant about the oneness of God because there's just too much material out there if people question, of course. if people truly surrender to Allah and they are studying, there's just too much information. As a matter of fact, Bart Ehrman wrote a great book recently entitled When Did Jesus Become God? There's just too much material out there. For, for me, as far as I'm concerned, unless some people are really, really old, um, then I'll give them an excuse. But for young people who are illiterate and can read, there's just no excuse. So, um, Ibn Kathir talks about the foolish people who don't look, don't search. You know, they just accept what people have said. Another reading that I would recommend for you is Karen Armstrong. Um, she was a former Roman Catholic nun, and she is well known for her books on the Abrahamic religions. Um, you can actually watch her on YouTube addressing issues of the Abrahamic faith. Her most famous work is A History of God, The 4,000 Year Quest of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And when she talks about the mirage, interestingly enough, on a video that I've seen, a CD of hers, um, she actually sounds like a Muslim. She gets emotional and her eyes fill with tears as she talks about the mirage. And when she talks about Prophet Muhammad, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, she sounds like she loves him. Is this whole thing on YouTube, do you think? Um, this book is not on YouTube, but some of her commentaries about the book are on YouTube. So we're going to talk a little bit about the historical link between Islam, Judaism, and Christianity. And I really should have typed that Judaism, Christianity, and Islam 
in the order that they came. I think that chronology helps make sense from a historical standpoint. But I think we well established in this class that Judaism, Judaism and Christianity existed in Arabia many centuries prior to the birth of Muhammad Sallallahu Separate communities of Jews and Christians settled primarily in Western and Southern Arabia. And as I've shared with you before that um, Christians used to stay in the Masajid at the time of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi as they would travel on the caravan routes, um, even Muslims would stay in Christian monasteries uh, at that time. And these were Trinitarian Christians, which I think is important for us to look at the tolerance, the acceptance, and the affirmation that we have for all people as Muslims. There is no compulsion of religion. Truth stands out over falsehood. But there's that beautiful story of Salahuddin who was in the masjid when the Christians from Najran were staying in the masjid and their cross. Now we know that this is where the wisdom comes in we talked about last week. When we're talking about this to people, that here were people in the masjid, there was a cross on a stick, it fell down and Salahuddin picked it up and leaned against the wall. We also know on the other side of that, that there's authentic hadith that the when the, um, at the end of time, the crosses will be destroyed because of the, the fallacy that is being promoted in that. But at the same time, the tolerance, the acceptance and affirmation was there at the time of the prophet to create the wisdom and the space for people to come. So we need to really adhere to that when we're doing dawah. Because a lot of times we just jump into the most offensive thing and browbeat people to death to try to get them to accept it. You know, instead of using the wisdom, we need to look at the kind of dawah that was done in the time of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Jews and Christians were the predominant businessmen in Medina. By the time of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's birth, one half of Medina's population was comprised of Jews. The presence of Jewish tribes dates back to 1200 BC when these, those tribes descended from Rachel, wandering in the Sinai. Between the years 132 to 135 AD, after a second disastrous failed uprising against Rome, much of the Jewish population fled to the Medina Mecca area of Arabia. If you listen to ignorant Muslims, they will make you think that these people did not exist. But if you study archaeology and you study the history, you will find sufficient evidence that these people did exist. And that we had very good relationships with them. So much so that when the Jews were driven out of Spain, we were their host. And that was their golden years. The best years of the Jews were when they were being under the hospitality of Muslims. It was called their golden years. So these Jews and Christians, they brought with them a superior knowledge of agriculture, coupled with business skills. They quickly became the most prosperous and powerful of the resident population. Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi interacted with the Jewish citizens often and early in his proclamation of the message received from Jibril, calling the Jews the people of the book, al Qatar. Despite the fact that many of them had not come, if you, look, if you remember the earlier tafsir of the earlier part of Surah al-Baqra, where they were called over and over and over again to Islam, there's still that tolerance, there's still that acceptance and that affirmation. Christianity was also present in the area, but had less impact on Islam due to the fact that the primary Christian centers were located on the periphery of the peninsula, north of Yemen, in Syria, and lower Iraq. There is an archaeological, historical record of a small Christian community thriving in Mecca prior to the birth of Islam, as well as during the lifetime of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This community consisted of caravan leaders, monks, merchants, doctors and dentists, blacksmiths, 
carpenters, and intellectuals such as teachers, orators, and scribes. The Apostle Paul's mission to Damascus firmly established that Christianity was in Syria, the land area directly to the north of Arabia. Now, what is really interesting, if you look into the um, Bibles of today that have been translated many, many, many times, you will find three different stories that talk about Paul's experience. And all of them contradict each other. One of them says that he fainted. One of them says that he talked. And I've never seen anybody talk while they fainted yet. But um, usually you're out. But it's there. If you read it, you'll see the contradictions in, the very, in that very story. Historical evidence reveals that the outreach of the early Christian community in Syria was successful and extended to the area of Mecca. Archaeological evidence for relatively small but important Christian community is affirmed by ancient artist drawings of Jesus and his mother Mary on the inner walls of the column. Now, Bill Baker, who was the founder of CAMP, which is Christians and Muslims for Peace, um, he came here many years ago, back in 2004 actually, and I was the MC, and he came and he talked about the uh, commonalities of Muslims and Christians. A, a variety of descendant Christian monks, primarily of the Monophysite, uh, and Monophysites are people that, in the person of Jesus Christ, there's only one nature, either wholly divine or sub uh, subordinately human. So if you study Bart Ehrman's book, When Did Jesus Become God, or some of the other scholars that have written about how the Trinity existed, then you find that there was a almost a 300 year period of time where there was a continuous argument where people were trying to define God and Jesus and their differences. But only in 325 AD was it established this doctrine known as the Trinity. And you can go to Encyclopedia Britannica and look up Trinity and the first, almost the first sentence there will be that in 325 AD the Nyasan Creed established this doctrine. Yes, brother. Do you think if we were if we were a, if we were how many books that were reading them, would we be able to understand them? Oh yes, I think you would be able to understand them. Absolutely. You're a college student. No doubt you would be able to, anybody would be able to understand them. Yeah. I'm not that smart. So if I can understand them, you can understand them. So, so this distant um, Christian monks that we're talking about um, were in North Arabia in the very midst of the popular caravans that we often hear about when we're reading biographies of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu We also know that there is persistent oral tradition that asserts that Muhammad Sallallahu as a caravan leader became friends with one of these monks called Bekhil. And does anybody remember the story about Bekhil? Didn't he see the, a, symbol, a sign on Muhammad Sallallahu that he was going to be a prophet? There's a birthmark around the shoulder blade of prophets. When he was young, he was asked this question, but there's another story when the hero was being addressed, and who addressed it? The hero. It was Khadija Radialan after Revelation, and when she went to see the hero, what did the hero tell her? He was a prophet. That this message that he had received was the same message that had been delivered by Jibreel to Isa alayhi salam. The same person. So there were these connections, there were these discussions that are very, very just out there if you read it. And so when we as Muslims adopt these positions that we do not talk or have anything to do with people of other faith, we shoot ourselves in the foot. And we're not practicing the Sunnah. Because our beloved Prophet had a lot of interactions with the Jews and the Christians. And there are many, many ahadiths to this effect. As a matter of fact, as you saw there, um, 
the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu received tunics and gifts of clothing from other Christian monks. Now, the attitude that a lot of people would have today is, I'm not going to accept anything from them. But that's not the sunnah. Our beloved Prophet received gifts from them. There were two Arab tribes of Christians, the Judhan and the Udhra, uh, that roamed the region. Monasteries lining the caravan routes were open and available to the ruling Bedouins, as well as the numerous as the numerous traveling caravans. Ancient monasteries record records reveal that the frequent visitors not only received food and shelter, but were directly exposed to the daily practices of prayer, fasting, and the giving of alms. Three of the five basic tenets of Islam. So people were being exposed. This was not something that they were absolutely aware. There was interfaith dialogue. Not ecumenical, but interfaith. Judaism and Christianity prepared the way for Quran's message of monotheism. And I think we've well established that. I think that, you know, we, we really, really build a foundation on understanding how the Holy Quran reports and talks about other revelations and how it did establish that there is one God and we will continue to do that in this class. Those listening to Muhammad would be familiar with his call to recognize and worship the one true God of all mankind. Judaism, Christianity, and Islam teach that Allah is without beginning and without end. Allah is not bound by the laws of nature which he created and sustains. He is not a form body, nor a measurable sustenance or substance. The Quran and Bible agree that in the beginning was God. It was Allah who began the beginning. It was God, the uncaused cause that began the eternal observable chain of cause and effect. Providing or proving that from nothing something began to exist. Called into existence by the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To ascribe such power and absolutes to any other is to practice idolatry or shirk, which is considered unpardonable in Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. In Surah 4 and verse 48, Allah will not forgive idolatry. He will forgive whom He will, all of the sins. He that serves Allah's besides Allah, God's besides Allah, has strayed far from the truth. The Bible likewise condemns the worshiping of any other besides God as idolatry in the first commandment. So if you look at Exodus, which is the second book of the Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourselves an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Does this not sound so in correlation to chapter 4 and verse 48? Yes, brother. How would you expound that on Christians? Because um, I have two, I would say, really good people. It's like, can tell that they are Christians or people of faith by the way that they walk. They, they're not the type of people that, you know, pound their chest, but they can, you can tell that they are good people. But yet, I've shown them chapters in the Bible, but they still believe that there is um, the three-in-one concept. Mm -hmm. um, but yet, and I also showed them where it says uh, that God has multiple sons, and Adam uh, I'm sorry, uh, Dawood was the first begotten son in the Bible, but yet they still don't see it. Basically, they're just, that's just seal on their heart that Allah is speaking of. That, but they're Only Allah can guide people to Islam. And this is why, you know, all our job is to do is to present what we know. And that's it. To still love, to accept, to affirm. <coughs> It reminds me of the verse in the Quran that says if an idolater comes to you, invite them to the way of truth. 
If they do not accept it, take them to a place of safety. They should always be safe with you. So when they do not accept it, don't get frustrated. That's not your job. Your job is simply to present the truth as it is. You know, people have asked me, people have come to me and said, would you show me? And I've spent hours with people showing them many, many verses. And it's not on me to bring people. I can't bring anyone to Islam, only Allah can. And so, you know, alhamdulillah, the beauty of it is that Allah's mercy is that on the day of judgment, they will stand behind their prophet and the law will be merciful, inshallah. Inshallah. Yes, brother. So we know that we can allow Christians to come to the masjid if they don't have any other uh, place to go, and they can worship their uh, their aspect of God. But what if, what if, like, say, polytheists come to the, come to the masjid? Would we allow the same thing? Well, what do you think? Do you think that? Those Christians from Najran were not polytheists that were in the masjid at the time of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu They were absolutely polytheists. So we don't judge people. That's Allah's department. And I think one of the things of wisdom that we as Muslims need to learn more than anything is to look at this. Because we actually drive people away. Because we are so stuck in what we believe. What we believe is truth. But we have to accept that it's right now. It's our truth. It's not their truth. They don't see it. It's not their subjective reality. And so we pray for them. We always make ourselves available. Because if we give up on them, they will never hear. And also respect their position. Yes. You have to respect your position. You know, it's one of the biggest things actually that I teach in marital education. Is that in a marriage, a man and a woman has their subjective reality. And their subjective reality, they will say, this is the facts. No, it's not the facts. It's what you believe. But you have to accept that it is their facts. And all the successfully married people in this room have been married for many, many years. Know that if you cannot accept the subjective reality of your partner and play ping pong with that, you're not going to get very far. <laughs> you, well, you will get far, but you'll spend a lot of money on divorce. <laughs> That's where you are. Now, somebody, yes. I, I just, one of the things with people that are not Muslim, I think the biggest thing for us is to lead by example. So as long as we're accepting and we love everybody for the sake of Allah and we treat everybody with respect, when they want to learn more about Islam or even come to Islam, it has nothing to do. It's not our, It's not something that we need to force or even encourage. We're just there, but we need to live our Islam, not worry about what everyone else is doing. I think that's the most important thing. But I think what's also amazing is if you look at these examples, if you look at the Ahabi, they had relationships. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu had formed relationships with these people. I mean... You know, I think about St. Luke's, United Methodist Church. Here I was, a United Methodist minister, studying to be a minister. And I cannot think of a place in Orlando that's more wide open to me than that place. And they know I'm not going anywhere. And yet, we have our potlucks there. I've spoken there. Um, we have people that care for us and love us there. And I think we have to respect that. We have to see the benefit in those relationships, the benefit in that diversity. <coughs> and that acceptance and affirmation is what the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did. And also with St. Luke's, they invite us to do a lot of interfaith work with them. Yes. We're not going there to push And we're not going there to convert anybody. Yeah. We're going there to build relationships, to build bridges of understanding. And they know that, and I think that's why they trust us. I think that's why we've been invited there. That's why they call me an honorary member. That's why they've had me to be on boards there. Because they know I'm not going there to undermine what they're doing. Tenacious monotheism accounts for the success of Islam, resisting such human ideologies as communism and capitalism, 
nationalism and materialism. And you might be saying, where in the world did you get that from? <laughs> this comes from the clash of civilization. How many people have read that? Oh, wow. I'm shocked. Okay. Um, not shocked in a bad way, just shocked. Um, it was required reading in our master's program in Islamic studies. If the citizens of the Western nation understood even this one simple single concept of Islam, none would have believed the propaganda of governments when they proclaimed various Muslim countries and leaders as communists. So in the clash of civilization in 1993, up to 4,000 Muslims, this is a quote, from over two dozen Islamic countries were, and then it's dot, 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 and it's talking about communism, <coughs> provoked intervention from countries that politically were fascist, communist, and. So there was this propaganda that was being promoted out there about Islam and communists, which is a joke. Because if you look at the unity of monotheism, and you look at the collective nature of Islam, where so many things are far kafaya, somebody in the community has to do the jula. Somebody in the community, a few people, have to do the janaza. Our whole religion is a collective religion. It's not this individual, it's my way, and it's my life, and I'll do with it what I want to, it's my body. It's not your body. It belongs to Allah. It's going to be returned to Allah. You just, got, it's so loan to you for 70 or 80 years if you're blessed to live that long. Were any people aware of this ideology out there? Okay. Um, and this, there was this big uh, propagation at the time of Darul Uloom and Darul Islam and Darul Harb, the, um, the land of war. and It was all propaganda. The same way as, you know, Islam was won by the sword. It was all propaganda. If you look at, um, uh, what is his name? Ibn Rush, not, not Ibn Rush. What was the book that was written? 